A big welcome to the 2021 Global Investigative Journalism Conference. This is our 12th conference since 2001, and it's our first entirely online. We're so glad that you could join us. In fact, GIJN staff around the world also wants to welcome you. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a la Conferencia Global de Periodismo de Investigación. Hola, bienvenidos a la Conferencia Global de Periodismo de Investigación. Selamat datang di Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Sejam bem-vindos à Conferência Global de Jornalismo Investigativo. Neto, meu irmão, meu irmão, vá aqui que eu dou a bem na caca da outra, o que não me tito, tito, me tá quei quei. Dobro pajalovat na Global no Conferência Jornalista Vrasledovatelei. Bienvenue à la Conférence Internationale de Journalisme d'Investigation. Global Investigative Journalism Conference mein aapka swagat hai. Herzlich willkommen zur Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Merhaba, küresel araştırmacı gazeteci konferansına hoş geldiniz. Okay, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Hi everybody, I'm David Kaplan. Uh, how great to have everybody at the 12th Global Investigative Journalism Conference. Just to uh, it was a quick welcome from our, <coughs> excuse me, from our regional editors and staff around the world. Uh, we're so glad you you joined us. Um, as we said, this is our first uh, all virtual global conference. Uh, obviously, because of the pandemic, we couldn't gather in person as we'd like to, but we're going to do our best online. We've got 200 speakers from 65 countries that we've gathered for uh, five days of, of cutting edge journalism, uh, the latest tools and techniques. As always, GIJN conferences focus on the practical. We're a working journalists conference. Uh, we're interested in giving you the tools and training uh, to get out there and go after abuses of power and lack of accountability. Uh, in this day of Zoom fatigue, we're extremely grateful uh, to have all of you here. We've got nearly 1,800 journalists registered for this conference from 148 countries. Uh, those are records for us. And I think it shows that investigative journalism, despite all the challenges we face, is alive and well. Uh, we face so many challenges today, uh, physical attacks, growing surveillance, uh, intimidation, legal harassment, online trolling and abuse, especially towards our female colleagues, a lack of financial support, a lack of resources, a lack of training. Yet despite all of this, uh, we're growing. Uh, despite all of this, our ranks continue to increase. Uh, when we first uh, formed GIJN as a nonprofit 10 years ago, uh, we had about a thousand followers on social media. Today, we have 350,000. People care about our profession. They care about the work that we do. Uh, we had 49 members back then. Uh, today, we have 211 member organizations in 82 countries. Um, every day, our staff sees the impact that you are having in, in the world. It, it may be hard for many of you to see, uh, but you're part of a uh, a global revolution in how the news media has has changed. Uh, we all know how many problems the media has. We're, we're on the inside. We see it firsthand. Uh, trivialization, sensationalism, uh, uh, owners who are not so enlightened. Uh, we fights in the newsrooms to get our stories out. We we, we know uh, all about that. But you are doing the best work in the news media. Don't ever doubt that. Uh, I like to call investigative journalists the special forces of journalism. You go after the most difficult targets. You have the best training and skills. You use the most sophisticated tools. Uh, despite everything, our field is growing. Um, let me tell you a little bit about a GIJN. Uh, your co-host, Global Investigative Journalism Conference. 
We began 20 years ago in 2001, when our founders, an American, Grant Houston, who you'll hear from soon, and a, a, a Danish fellow, Nils Molvad, were doing workshops on what was then called computer-assisted reporting. Of course, we call that data journalism today. Grant turned to Nils and said, next time, why don't we invite the world? We didn't know if anybody would come, uh, but they booked a hotel in Copenhagen and 300 journalists from 30 countries came. And it was like a religious revival. It turned out we all had the same problems. We all had the same issues that we could help each other by collaborating. We needed sources and, 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 and uh, uh, techniques that cross borders because our stories were increasingly global. It was like a, a light bulb went off over everyone's head. It was the first of 12 global meetings that kept getting larger. At our second gathering, uh, 30 groups came together under Brandt and Nils's leadership to uh, form a network because there, there was no institutional base. There was no global hub for the world's investigative journalists. Health reporters had an association, science writers did, education writers did, but the, the journalists who went after the most difficult stories had no single source of international support. So they formed a, a, a network, about 30 groups joined up and they called it the Global Investigative Journalism Network. That, those were the origins of GIJN. Um, 10 years later, we created a nonprofit because we were getting so many requests for assistance and capacity building and, 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 and training from around the world. And so GIJN, the nonprofit came uh, into being. Um, today, GIJN has staff in 24 countries that are working virtually to connect, network, train, and support the world's investigative journalists. Although we're a membership uh, organization, uh, we're composed of nonprofits uh, 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 that uh, are open to all journalists. The, the network, all the things that we offer, uh, we're in 12 languages a day. We run a help desk, a resource center. All of these are open to journalists everywhere. And of course we do workshops and webinars and conferences like this one. Um, each day at this conference, uh, our resource center will be releasing a, a new guide. If you get a chance, check out today's uh, a publication of a reporter's guide to investigating organized crime. Uh, it's on our website. You'll, you'll find uh, a panel on it tomorrow. We uh, have contributions from nine top crime reporters in six countries. We gathered today in a troubled time, in, in an era when watchdog journalism has never been more important, that the list of pressing issues that we face is vast. Uh, climate change, pandemics, inequality, autocracy. Uh, as our work spreads worldwide, we're facing a mighty backlash of autocrats, oligarchs, and kleptocrats, killings of journalists, uh, are actually down, but the tactics have changed. Uh, the attacks on journalism itself appear to be at an all-time high. Uh, in, in the words of veteran Pakistani editor Zafar Abbas, they are no longer trying to kill journalists, they are trying to kill journalism. Even in countries where we felt relatively secure, we have our backs to the wall. But those who believe in free and independent media are pushing back, and there is hope out there. The awarding of a Nobel Peace Prize to our colleagues, Dmitry Muratov of Russia's Novaya Gazeta and Maria Reza of the Philippines Rappler shines a needed global light on the importance of a free watchdog press. Democratic governments, development agencies, the UN, and now the Nobel Committee all recognize that investigative journalism is as important as economic development and education to our collective future. That's why we're leading this conference with a plenary session on the global struggle to sustain a watchdog press. Uh, before we get into that, let me just talk very quickly about some of the other themes we'll be 
developing at GIJC 21. Uh, climate change. This week, global leaders are gathering in Glasgow, Scotland to try and put controls on planet poisoning emissions. Uh, the stakes could not be higher. This is likely the story of the 21st century and we as investigative journalists need to focus on it. This conference is full of tools and techniques for investigative journalists to help report on what's going on. We've got two panels that directly focus on climate change, including on Friday, a report uh, from a team in Glasgow who will talk about what's going on from an investigative perspective. Uh, security and safety. In the past, we at GIJN left much of the discussion on safety and security to our colleagues at other journalism organizations. No more. The attacks on journalists, particularly investigative journalists, have become too many and too severe for us to ignore. Yet you'll find a robust track of six different sessions with some of the smartest people we could find on safety and security. Tomorrow is the UN-sponsored uh, International Day to End Impunity Against Attacks Against Journalists. Uh, we take this day very seriously. 90% of the murders of journalists have gone unsolved. Uh, this has to change. And, and we, we thank UNESCO for its role in sponsoring the day. Uh, we have a special panel tomorrow uh, in commemoration with uh, journalists who are on the front lines investigating these attacks on their colleagues and they're doing some amazing work. Also tomorrow, we will introduce the JSAT, the Journalism Security Assessment Tool. It's something that uh, GIJM was fortunate to work with experts at the Ford Foundation. Uh, it's a self-test that gives newsrooms uh, an instant report on uh, how, how good their security is, both physically and, and digitally. Uh, we've also got specialists from the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. We're doing two workshops on managing stress and burnout. Looking forward to that. Uh, data. As always, we've got a strong track on data journalism from basic methods to advanced techniques. Uh, thanks to Brant Houston and Jennifer LaFleur, we've got an extraordinary team from eight countries who will give you the latest on analysis, scraping, mapping, visualization, coding and more. Um, and as always, we will continue to emphasize tools and techniques. Uh, we've got people on satellite data and mapping, uh, online search strategies, video forensics, and uh, all kinds of issues. Okay, enough uh, from me. I, I want to uh, hand this over to GIJN's deputy director, uh, Gabriella Manuli. Um, I talked to Gabby, who has been uh, uh, with me at GIJN since 2013, GIJN success is as much hers as uh, uh, anyone's. Um, I, I uh, uh, talked to Gabby yesterday and for Halloween, uh, she's got two small kids. She was dressed up as Wonder Woman, which I thought was wonderfully appropriate. You, you, you are GIJN's Wonder Woman. Gabby. Uh, G Gabby's a native of Argentina, although she lives in Budapest, Hungary. She's worked for uh, all kinds of media, uh, was on the investigative team at Perfil, one of uh, Buenos Aires' top uh, newspapers. And uh, 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 she's been with me now through seven conferences, Gabby. This is our eighth together. Thank you so much, Gabriela Manuli. Thank you, Dave, for the kind words. I, I, I won't take long, but first of all, bienvenidos, welcome. As Dave said, I have worked for seven conferences for GIJN already, uh, starting back in the global one in Rio in 2013, then Lily Hammer, Johannesburg and Hamburg, plus three Asian ones, Manila, Nepal, and Seoul. In between, I had two kids. <laughs> Uh, so for some of the conference, I worked till last minute, but then I couldn't travel because I was busy giving birth. Uh, and some of those conferences, I went with babies in tow, in tow. So I would say that one of the highlights of this almost 10 year has been meeting all these wonderful investigative journalists from all over the world, 
there is a tru truly a sense of community. And for me, they are part of an extended family. Imagine the some top investigative reporters that even help babysitting my kids during conference. So that that's the level of closeness. Uh, as they said, having this conference online is a big challenge. And not just because of the crazy logistics and, and Zooms, but because it would never be the same as an in-person event. But with that in mind, what I suggest is that we all, all of us, us and you, embrace this online conference and this virtual setting, and we focus on the differences and, and the things that this setting allows from a different perspective. For example, having it online allows us to have a much bigger fellowship program. This year, we are awarding 357 fellowships from almost 100 countries with a perfect gender balance. And this goes in, in line with the diversity we have this year in the conference. We have a record 148 countries represented at GIJC 21. That's most of the world. <laughs> and we have worked hard to balance the sessions by gender, geography, and diversity. We are very proud of that. Uh, as in our last conference in Hamburg, we also uh, have gender diversity in the speakers. And in fact, a little secret this year, we have a little bit more female reporter than men. Uh, being online also allow a lot of people to come and gives you opportunity to, to be in contact with reporters or, or, or people that you really wanted to connect. So I highly suggest that you take your time and you read the frequently asked questions that will also help our visiting. We try to put as much information as possible there and also read the networking uh, opportunities that it allows. As a brief summary, some things you can do, you can attend our networking sessions and also our meetup with different GIJ and staffers. You can follow and connect our regional editors. They can help you in a way being ambassadors if you are shy or you need some help or reaching someone, they are there to help. You can also arrange your own meetings. There is a, se a section there. You can have one-on-ones on Zoom via Pathable platform. And you can also add more people than one to those meetings. You can go to the discussion forum and you can browse the exhibitor hall. And lastly, uh, you all know because you, you acknowledge this when you register, but there is a code of conduct of the conference. So take your time to read it. And if you have any trouble related to that, a few of us at the team will be ready to help. So thanks and looking forward to this week with all of you. Thank you, Gabby. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce another one of the GIJN team. Uh, Eunice Au is our program manager. Eunice is originally from Malaysia where she reported for the New Straits Times and, and Singapore's Straits Times. We, we found her uh, in Budapest where we were looking for help. Uh, it was five years ago, Eunice, that you joined us. Uh, she proved quickly so valuable in so many ways that we, we can't imagine GIJN but without her. Uh, many of you may know her from uh, her editing of uh, our popular weekly column, Data Journalism Top 10. Uh, Eunice, over to you. Hi, everyone. Salamat datang and welcome. Huan Ying. Uh, this is my fifth conference with GIJN, and I'm very much looking forward to the electric energy that's always generated by putting so many amazing journalists together in one space. So at GIJN, we are doing our best to make our resources accessible to as many journalists as possible in as many languages as we can. So we are very glad with the help of our funders to be able to offer interpretation this time in Arabic, Chinese, French, Japanese, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish for 22 sessions live. You can find these translations indicated at the top of the relevant sessions with a black bar. We will also be adding subtitled translations for selected sessions in the future, so look out for that. And to ensure you have the best conference experience, please update your Zoom application now if you haven't already done so. And you can personalize your own agenda by clicking the plus button at the top right of the sessions you are interested in. Make sure you don't miss out on joining them live because our speakers are setting aside time for question and answers at the end of each panel or workshop. And if you need technical help, click on the need help get support button on the top of the GIJC21 Puffable website. 
We also have added help desk hours to the agenda uh, every day. So feel free to reach out to us by putting in a comment in the help desk chat. We will be there to answer your questions. All right, back to you, Dave. Thank you, Eunice. Okay, our, our, our next uh, speaker, it's fair to say that we would not be here today were it not for Brant Houston. Uh, Brant served as executive director of the big US-based association, investigative reporters and editors, uh, where he helped spread data and investigative journalism around the world. He co-founded this conference and GIJN itself, uh, uh, and literally wrote the book on data journalism. I, I mean that, he, he wrote the book, Data for Journalism. It's now in its fifth, fifth edition, I think, Brent. Uh, when he's not on the road, he is the night chair of investigative reporting at the University of Illinois. Uh, and he is also chair of the GIJN Board of Directors. Uh, Brent, look at what you did. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, I want to add my welcome to what I consider the premier conference in the world for investigative journalists. Uh, as Dave said, the first global conference was 20 years ago. Uh, Co-founder Niels Mulvad and I had no idea who would attend, but it was, it was clearly an idea whose time had come uh, with 300 journalists from 40 countries. That's how we started. Uh, the forming of the network was to create training and collaborations between the conferences and to be a passionate voice for investigative journalism and how much it matters for free and democratic societies. In addition, the creation of the network was a pivotal moment in the history of journalism in which the idea of collaboration over competition prevailed. And because of that, we create a vibrant future for investigative reporting and a network that embraces change and technology for the betterment of the profession. It is inspiring and humbling to see how far we've come. And I wanna thank all of you for joining this gathering and contributing to the work we do. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brant. Uh, uh, again, we, we would not be here were it not for your uh, uh, perceptive and visionary efforts over the years. Um, we, uh, we, we thought that doing uh, an online conference would be easier than our in-person ones. We were wrong. <laughs> These are pretty complicated and, and the way that uh, we're going about it, uh, uh, we've got, you've heard we're translating into seven languages. Uh, we have 200 speakers. The, the speakers alone are from 65 countries. And trying to coordinate that on the technical end, doing 80 sessions in, in uh, uh, most of it in four days, uh, it's, it's been something. Uh, fortunately, we have a terrific team, and I need to thank some people because they have done such a phenomenal job. So, so bear with me for just a minute. Uh, I, I want to thank especially our, um, uh, our online producer, Andrea Romanos. You, you, you won't see these people because they're behind the scenes mostly, but they are the ones really making this stuff happen. Andrea, you did so many things uh, for us. We have another Argentine uh, uh, manager, our, our business uh, manager, without whom GIJM would be lost, Cora Moyano. Uh, our conference uh, coordinator, Melinda Cook. Uh, our producer, Leonardo Peralta who is somewhere in Italy right now, I think. Our program director, Ann Koch in London. Uh, our resource center director, Nicolia Apostolo in Athens. Uh, our translations coordinator, Smarando Tolosano, Smaranda, uh, and everyone else. Our regional editors, our editorial team, our IT people and, and others. It's been a true uh, team effort. I want to also give uh, my personal thanks to GIJN's board of directors. Uh, virtually all of them have been involved in this conference in some way as speakers, moderators, advisors. Uh, they have been instrumental in making this happen as well. F finally, to all of our speakers and moderators who volunteer their time, uh, you don't have to do this, we know. Uh, and we know how busy people are and how many deadlines people are juggling. Uh, you, you do this because you believe sharing your knowledge makes this world better. And we, 
we so appreciate that. Um, we also couldn't make this happen without our donors and co-sponsors. Um, Andrea, can you share our, our slides? Uh, let me just show you who's, who's helping pay the bills. Uh, big, big thanks to uh, all of these folks. Uh, the, the Bay and Paul Foundations, uh, Ford Foundations, Open Society, Humanity United. Well, you can see here, Andrea, if you can keep going to the next slide. There we go, there, there's, there's more. Um, uh, Humanity United, uh, Porticus, the Logan Foundation, uh, Newmark Philanthropies, Folio. Uh, uh, huge thanks to, to all of you. We have a program, next slide, please. We have a program uh, where we invite our member organizations and partner uh, partners around the world. If they send at least 10 people, uh, they become a co-sponsor. And uh, we had 27 organizations respond to that. So about one, one out of seven people at this conference is coming from GIJN's member organizations and groups that we work with closely around the world. Uh, this is up on our site uh, they also, most of them have booths in the exhibitors floor uh, online. So you, you can check out the, the terrific work uh, they do. Uh, there's, there's so many great groups here. Uh, a special shout out to Scoop, our partners at Norway's Association of Investigative Journalists who support us every year to Network Research, our, our German partners uh, uh, who co-hosted our last global conference in, in Hamburg and uh, really everyone, on, I don't have time to, to run through everyone. I, I wish I did. Um, okay, uh, finally, and this really is finally, I, I wanna thank our co-host, the uh, Judith Nielsen Institute for Journalism and Ideas based in Sydney. We, we were fortunate to work with such a great team there, especially Andrea Ho and Rebecca Joseph, uh, thanks so much. Uh, and to JNI's executive director, Mark Ryan, who took a chance on partnering with what must have looked to you, Mark, as a, a ragtag bunch of muckraking journalists. Um, uh, Mark knows the media from all sides. He is a former journalist himself. He worked for 25 years as an executive at Westfield Corporation. He was a senior political advisor to Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating. Uh, he's the one who did the initial study that called for a journalism institute that would provide help to, to Australia's uh, 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 serious news media and, and, and then to the entire region. Uh, he, Mark's gonna tell you a bit more about JNI and, and equally important, he's going to invite you to join us in Sydney next year for GIJC 22. I am so pleased to welcome Mark Ryan. Mark. Thank you very much, David, and hello, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure for the Judith Nielsen Institute to be a co-host of this online conference. And it's a particular pleasure to share the screen with so many distinguished colleagues, and especially with Grant. Um, Brand, as you spoke, you said that you were humbled by what's been achieved, but I think it's fair to say you're entitled to be incredibly proud. As David was rattling off some of those statistics about how, how quickly um, GIJN has grown from that initial idea you had 20 or more years ago is just incredible. And to think you're sitting here tonight participating in this 2021 conference with 148 countries participating is an incredible achievement, so congratulations. Um, JNI is a new organization, um, and so I'm really grateful that David and the team have given me this opportunity to take a few minutes to tell you about us, about how we were established and the kind of work that we're doing. So we're about two years old, we're based in Sydney, and we were, were established by an Australian philanthropist named Judith Nielsen. Judith is fairly well known in this part of the world for her interest in art, and in particular, uh, contemporary Chinese art. Over the last 25 years or so, she's built up one of the world's leading collections of contemporary Chinese art. And she displays that, <clears throat> excuse me, she displays that free to the public here in her gallery here in Sydney. 
But Judith is very engaged with the wider world and takes a deep interest in what's going on in the wider world. And a few years ago, she decided that journalism needed a helping hand and wanted to do something about it. So she has provided the funding to establish JNI. She does not, however, play any role in the day-to-day -day operations of the Institute. Instead, we're led by an independent board and we're supported and guided by an international advisory council, uh, many members of which are participating in, in this year's conference. So the independence of the Institute was a critical factor for Judith in, in setting this up. So what do we do? We do three things, principally. We provide funding for journalists to do their jobs um, better, to, to try and support the production of more and better quality journalism. And we support journalists across the board and newsrooms across the board, large, small, individual freelance journalists, um, hyperlocal startups, everything to do. As long as it's about quality journalism, we are interested in it. We also are developing an education stream that we hope will help equip working journalists uh, again to do their jobs better. And we are also the host uh, of events, everything from off the record, closed door meetings through to major conferences, such as the one we're participating in this week. We try and have an emphasis or focus on the front, what we call the frontiers of journalism. So, so journalists and newsrooms that are trying new things, new techniques, new forms of journalism, that's what we wanna support. We appreciate that business models, the funding of journalism is a challenge um, at the moment, but we're really keen to help those that are pushing the boundaries, doing those things that are perhaps are a little riskier, perhaps things that newsrooms, which are already under financial strain, can't quite afford to do. And we've found already in our own short life that for one of re relatively small amounts of funding, we can make a big difference. So we're really help, uh, keen to help people push the frontiers uh, of journalism. Um, we think it's an exciting time to be doing this. We are, we're all aware, as David mentioned earlier, of the challenges that are facing journalism around the world. Um, but our sense is that we do seem to be emerging from this decade or more of turbulence, where journalism and the news industry has gone through an unprecedented period of change and upheaval. Um, yes, the challenges are there. Um, the sustained attack on, on press freedom is just one of those obvious challenges. But we do think there are green shoots that are sprouting in all kinds of ways. And that gives us a lot of optimism for the future of journalism. So our aim really is to try and nurture those green shoots and do what we can to put some wind in the sails of, of quality journalism and investigative journalism. So just one of the reasons that we're so thrilled to be part of this conference is the renewed focus that David and his entire team at GIJN is placing on our part of the world, the Asia and Asia and the Pacific. We're all aware that Asia is once again the center of the world. Strategically, politically, geopolitically, Asia is leading the world in technological innovation. And it's also at the center of the big geopolitical conflicts and rivalries um, that are happening at the moment. So Asia needs more and better reporting and analysis on our region, and it needs it more than ever. And so JNI wants to play its part, modest though it might be, to help address that challenge. And that's why uh, we have already invested heavily in journalism in Asia. Um, just this year, for example, I'll mention two projects that we've been involved in. One is that we've put together a number of reporting collaborations between newsrooms across the region, involving all kinds of journalists and all kinds of newsrooms to tackle big substantive stories in ways that they could not have done on their own. And they have already proven to be very highly successful collaborations. Last month, we launched our News in Asia report. This is the first iteration of what we hope will be a 
timeless document in the sense that we will now continue to update it on an ongoing basis, looking at issues of importance for journalism in our part of the world. We hope it will become the go-to resource tool for anybody that wants to know anything about what's happening with journalism and news media in Asia and the Pacific. And I encourage um, everybody listening to visit our website and check out the News in Asia report. That will give you a very good sense of the kind of things that JNI is working on and is interested in. It's hugely encouraging to see so many journalists from our region participating in this week's conference. Dave tells me that uh, they have registered in record numbers uh, and that's, that's terrific. Every journalists from China, from Hong Kong, Japan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Papua New Guinea, the Pacific Islands and more. And I'm aware that um, I appreciate that journalists from these places have participated in GIJC in years gone by, but, but never before in the numbers that they have. And we're hugely encouraged uh, by that. So in 12 months time, uh, as David mentioned, we will be hosting the GIJN Global Conference here in Sydney, in person. And we think that uh, we will be able to stage with Dave and his team a truly exceptional conference. And we want to encourage all of you to come and also encourage you to share the news about Sydney 2022 with your networks and encourage those people as well to register so that we can make the conference in 2022 a huge success. To whet your appetite uh, uh, to start planning a visit to Sydney next year, we've prepared a short video, which we will play with you now, and then I'll come back uh, to say farewell and hand back to David. So let's play the video. Thank you. So in closing, I'd just like to reinforce that invitation, extend that invitation as widely as I can for you to register to come to Sydney next year. Uh, before I close and hand over to David, I just want to say thank you again to David and his team, to Gabby, to Eunice, to Andrea, who I know has done so much uh, work behind the scenes and is making this incredibly complicated conference work, which is always important. I'd also like to acknowledge our team here, particularly Andrea Ho, and Rebecca Joseph, who've been working around the clock um, uh, with Dave and the team to, to make this happen. So thank you, thank you for giving me a few moments to tell you about the Judith Nielsen Institute. Please go to our website, check us out, get in touch with us, uh, and I look forward to seeing you in Sydney in 2022. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, we will see you in Sydney, Sydney or bust, <laughs> we are determined to gather in person next year. Uh, okay, we're, we're running late. Thank you all for bearing with us. Uh, it is now my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, one of my favorite people for, for those, she's a frequent speaker at our events. And for uh, those of you who've heard me introduce Sheila Cornell before, uh, forgive me for, for, the, for you others, you should hear this. Uh, uh, when we start organizing a big conference like this, we start with a very small number of trusted advisors. We ask their advice about the most pressing issues we should cover, uh, who've done the best stories, who are the best trainers, uh, what are the newest techniques, uh, and then we build outward from there. Uh, one of my first calls is always to an extraordinary professor at the Columbia Journalism School. Sheila Coronel's accomplishments are too numerous for me to list here, but let me give a few highlights. Uh, after a distinguished career as a political reporter, 
for newspapers in Manila, Philippines. Uh, she, in 1989, co-founded a group called the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, PCIJ. PCIJ became a model. It, it showed that you could take what was then a still pretty experimental structure in the West, uh, a nonprofit investigative journalism center, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and it could work in the global South. It not only worked, it was extraordinarily successful. Uh, within years, they had built a, a file on then President Joseph Estrada showing that he had hidden millions and millions of dollars in assets. It falsely declared uh, that he didn't have them. It became a part of the impeachment hearings that were held in the Philippine Congress and led to a popular uh, uprising that led to his resignation. It was the Philippines Watergate scandal. Um, uh, Sheila moved on. She uh, took up a career in teaching and was just as successful at the Columbia J School in New York. She founded and still directs the Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism. Until recently, she was the school's academic dean. She's authored numerous books and guides to investigative journalism. And I know firsthand uh, how many uh, young journalists you've inspired around the world, Sheila. When it comes to dealing with autocrats and kleptocrats, uh, she has firsthand experience. She worked in Manila as a journalist uh, under the notorious strongman Ferdinand Marcos. And even today, she's documenting abuses by its current president, Rodrigo Duterte. So it, it was a no brainer for us to ask Sheila to anchor our conference plenary today, autocrats, oligarchs, and kleptocrats the global fight for a watchdog press. Uh, Sheila will be leading a discussion with four equally extraordinary journalists that we are so proud to host from Colombia, France, India, and Nigeria. I'm looking forward to this. Sheila Coronel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dave, for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be opening this, this conference, and I hope to see you all in person very soon um, next year. So we want this to be a participatory uh, panel because you know we're, we're all so disconnected now. So in, in the next several minutes, I'm going to ask you to, to answer a poll and then we'll do, we'll do a ch chat storm. So this is a panel about sustaining watchdog journalism in this very difficult moment. What are our challenges? and how do we overcome them? So as Dave said, some of us have worked in highly restrictive environments before. Some of us are here again. For others, this is new. And there are watchdog journalists in, in this conference who have never really worked in a country where the press is free. I think I've been asked to moderate this panel partly because I started my journalistic life under strongman rule in the kleptocracy of Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. 35 years later, the Philippines is being ruled by another strong man, Rodrigo Duterte. An election scheduled next year, the former dictator's son, Ferdinand Jr., is a top contender for the presidency. But I know we are not alone. Around the world, democracy is facing an existential crisis, including the country where I currently reside, the United States. They've eloquently spoke about the threats journalists are facing. We are being sued, jailed, or killed. We are facing digital surveillance and harassment. We are being drowned in a flood of lies. The polls just came in, so please feel free. On top of all this, we are dealing with COVID-19. Last April, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that the pandemic could become a media extinction event. Ad revenues for the news media have declined up to 75% in the last 18 months. Many of us now say we are in survival mode. We must scale down our ambitions of bringing about reforms. We just need to survive this difficult, polarized, autocratic and pandemic moment. The question for us is this, and this is the question this panel is going to talk about, is investigative journalism's theory of change still valid? Watchdog journalists believe that, I, that by exposing wrongdoing, they can bring wrongdoers to justice and bring about reforms. 
Is that still possible in this toxic and difficult information space? If democracy itself is under threat, should journalists be defending not just their freedoms, but democracy as well? Here to help out, help me answer these questions, and I will introduce them shortly, are some of the best dependent and journalists at the front lines of investigative reporting around the world. So we have this poll because we want to know where you are coming from and how you're thinking about press freedom and democracy in your country. So please help us answer these questions while I do these introductions. I'll start alphabetically. Vinod Jose is the executive editor of The Caravan, India's first long form narrative and investigative journalism magazine. Caravan has covered in depth the rise of right wing Hindu nationalism and exposed numerous scandals in India involving the government of the current Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and the former Prime Minister, Manhaman Singh. Dapo Oloriyun Yomi is the publisher and CEO of Premium Times in Nigeria, an independent award-winning newspaper. He was co-founder of the news magazine in Lagos and founder of the Wallace Soyinka Center for Investigative Journalism. During the military regime of Sani Abacha, Dapo moved to the US and returned home in 2005 to be the director of Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Dapo has won numerous prizes for his work, including the International Editor of the Year Award. And from Europe, Edwin Plenny is one of the best known political journalists in France, former editor-in-chief of Le Monde, currently the president and co-founder of Mediapart, an independent web-based investigative journalism outlet created in 2008. Finally, Maria Teresa Ronderos is a journalist from Colombia and founder and co-director of the Latin American Center for Investigative Journalism, or CLIP. Before that, she headed the independent journalism program of the Open Society Foundation. She is a columnist and author of many books. So let me start by asking a question from our panelists. Given the difficulties of the current moment, what is the, current, what is the role of the watchdog press in your country? or region? And what difference do you think your work makes? Let me start with, with Vino Jos, who's in, a, in a, facing 10 sedition suits in India. Vino. Thank you, Sheila. Um, absolutely. I think the time that we are living in certainly is putting a lot of stress, not just on journalism, but democracy uh, in its entirety. Uh, so that means that there is stress on society life, academia, free thinking. So uh, we have to see when strongmen rise and when they change a country like mine um, from elected democracy to elected, bring it down to an elected autocracy, you see the kind of stress on uh, journalists and they use all kinds of tools, often from old colonial era rules to social media uh, companies and their um, you know, effort to make the, uh, the companies profitable. Now, uh, you're right when you said about the 10 sedition cases, for example, um, uh, filed against me and many of my colleagues in India. And uh, of course, on the one hand, uh, last time when as Indians we heard uh, sedition was charged in, 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 in our school curriculum was when our freedom fighters were fighting for the independence from colonial rule. Now, um, journalists are supposed to be certainly not in that league in a free country. Uh, so you, on the one hand, you have them using uh, rules and law books and weaponizing them so that journalists can be silenced, institutions can be silenced. Um, and uh, they go after the institution of journalism, not just one organization. And that's very systematic that they do. Uh, uh, and then the way that they're doing it, often it's very difficult for us to resist because they work with media owners, they work with advertising models, they work with individual journalists. So it's, it, it's a 360 degree attack. And then it's, it's, uh, it's very evident. It's, it's there in, in my neighboring country, Pakistan. It's, it's there in Sri Lanka. It's there in Philippines, uh, then there Asia uh, uh, is certainly going under a lot of stress and not just Asia, but all over the world. 
Um, and we have seen in Afghanistan uh, in the recent months, journalists are queuing up to leave the country because it, 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 there's been a take on, it has been taken over. Uh, and we see a, a similar pattern in, in India, for example, we, um, we are making a religious state out of what was constitutionally promised as um, a secular socialist republic where people, uh, plurality will be respected. So uh, in a country like India, Caravan as a magazine or many other independent organizations like ours um, uh, are being targeted. Um, uh, their software is being used to spy upon uh, journalists uh, and cases are being registered. So I think the fight in, in, in many sense for us is global as much as it is local uh, because everyone, uh, the bad people all got united in many sense uh, in killing democracy. And I think uh, the time has come from last century, probably, um, you know, after Second World War, there was a thinking all over the world that democracy needs to be protected, institution needs to be built, rule of law and freedom of press needs to be taken together. And I think uh, this is a repeat of the same time that we had seen 78 years ago now as well. Dapo, you've been here before and had to leave Nigeria because of your work as a journalist. What is the role, what is, you see, what is the, what has the watchdog press in your country been able to accomplish despite all of the problems? Oh, thank you so very much, Sheila. Um, I think uh, the watchdog press, watchdog journalism is in demand to fulfill three key issues. And it has not changed. Um, first, of course, is it helps to give concrete meaning and consequence to the fact that journalism really is a project of democracy. Um, and uh, that means in essence that, you know, the very first thing that we are called uh, to do is uh, to make sure that we provide uh, accountability and audit of the democratic process, making sure that institutions and political leaders, uh, political actors, uh, come under the razor and then they can provide uh, accountability for the roles they play. Related to this, of course, is the whole question of helping to build what you call the public square. Uh, indeed, to make sure that you have uh, a very fecund uh, community uh, and opinion that helps to enrich debates about how uh, country and processes uh, uh, will run. But, you know, above all, uh, is the gatekeeping uh, function that we always uh, ascribe to the watchdog uh, journalism, because really um, our work <laughs> is to start stay in that gap and ensure that we can aggregate uh, views of common interest uh, and make sure that this is stable before political leaders to give uh, meaning to it. I think you, uh, if we narrow this down, you see that there's an unevenness about how to fulfill this, uh, not only in Nigeria, but in the region uh, itself. But luckily, uh, with possible exception of say South Africa, Ghana, and Namibia, that's been able to find uh, clauses in the constitution to protect this uh, watchdog role. Um, increasingly, we are seeing that uh, uh, constitution making in uh, Africa is also paying attention to this. And you find in one way or the other that uh, journalism is then explicitly defined in very legal terms as uh, a watchdog mechanism for the democratic process. Um, one last point, I think, since you asked to see what then we have been able to do at our own domestic Nigerian level, I, I, I would say also that perhaps uh, building on all these global processes, no, no doubt, you know, influenced by the kind of great work that GIGN had done over the years, we've been able to help uh, advance uh, the non-for-profit newsroom model. Um, secondly, we've really helped to, obviously we didn't start <laughs> investigative journalism, but we've helped to exponentially, you know, expand its reach and meaning in the, in the country. Um, and I think lastly, but more, most importantly, the fact that journalism in troubled times will need all the help it will, it will get. Uh, so we've helped to also 
uh, innovate on how to really create a new funding model in a very troubled times like this. Thank you, Dapa. Maria Teresa, you too, I mean, lot, parts of Latin America have been under strong men rule, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and now we're seeing that resurgence. What do you see is, what is the Watchdog Press able to do in, in, in your region? Thanks, Sheila. Well, in my part of the world, I think Watchdog Media are really busy. <laughs> We have more countries under dictators, territories still under terror of organized crime and drug, uh, you know, narco terrorism and that kind of um, uh, rule, which is also present in many parts of Latin America. We have multinational corporations abusing their power. We have many contributing lead to climate change. We have growing concentration of wealth. This is the continent where any inequality is the worst. Yeah. And many of our justice systems have been co-opted by private interests. So we do have a lot, a lot of work, uh, uh, you know, and we, in our short experience with the Latin American Center for Investigative Journalism with CLIP, we were we barely a, a little over two years old. And we have already worked with 70 different teams of investigative reporters across the continent and produced about um, 15 investigations. So these, these watchdog uh, groups, either small teams, sometimes with very little uh, budget, and sometimes big teams in, 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 in big outlets still resisting and still surviving to do investigative journalism. And they are, they are doing amazing stories. I think one of the best examples would be how they brought down, as you may say, Alex Saab, this, this, uh, this crony of, of Maduro in Venezuela. And this was, these were journalists in exile who actually did this investigation, that they were forced into exile because of this investigation. And then they held him to account. They continued that story. They were relentless. And now Alex Saab was finally put behind uh, bars in, in the United States after a lot, a lot of work. So uh, there are lots of new and old cross-border initiatives and they, we couldn't do anything without these small outlets. Many of them, you know, uh, putting themselves at, at great risk in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and, and, and I would say, to also to Mexico, Brazil, and our own Colombia. And some of the stories we have done show in clip, show in, a, in many ways what this power of collaboration can do and how watchdog journalism in Latin America is actually finding this power and, and making its voice much, much stronger. So for example, we did story on how uh, fundamental evangelicals in Latin America, um, uh, 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 what role they played as a back channel for Trumpist politics in our countries. We have shown the suffering of absurd policies in migrants that come from Asia and Africa into Latin America. We have documented illegal logging in the Amazon. And we have even uh, see the Mexican, uh, help the, the Mexican prosecution see more of the culprits behind the murder of a colleague, Miroslava Bridge. So these collaborations show that despite the big challenges, despite the growing number of autocrats and kleptocrats in Latin America, it, it, investigative co it, reporting is joining forces. They keep che uh, checking abuse in their government and they don't give up. And even in those countries where apparently there is no hope, like you don't see there's not gonna be any change. And I'm responding to your question about the theory of change of investigative journalism that, okay, you, you denounce, you, you unearth the wrongdoing and then there's no justice to take over and, and continue the job. There's no institutions, but even then they continue to do so because in, in a, in a way, they know they, they will prevail in the long run. And I think that Alex Saab's story uh, with the Armando team in, in Venezuela, it's one of the most revealing in this way. They 
prevailed and they got justice at the end, despite working against all odds. So I think there is a lot of hope in Latin America and there is a lot of strong work in investigative reporting. I think it's like, I would say it's like a golden age of investigative reporting in Latin America, uh, as I have never seen it in, in, in many years. Thank you, Maria Teresa, that's, that's very hopeful. Edwi, let's talk about Europe and particularly France where the challenges are different. You know, the press is free, France is a mature democracy, but certainly it's, do you think it's a good time for watchdog journalism? Uh, hello, everybody. First, I want to warmly thank GIGN for all the work in the service of the right to know everywhere in the world. Investigative journalism is at the forefront of the fight for a real, concrete, true democracy in our times, respective the, respecting the first human rights for me. That's the ideal of equality without distinction of birth, origin, religion, appearance, belief, race, sex, or gender. I am in France. It's not now a mature democracy. It's becoming a low intensity democracy, seriously challenged by undemocracy forces. Forces that are against freedom of expression, against free press, against independent justice, against the fight about corruption, authoritarian forces, racist, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, sexism. That's the reality at this time, even in Europe. We are all really worried about the rise, not only in the young countries in developing situation, but also in oldest democracy, the United States, but also France, Europe, Hungary, Poland, of authoritarian, authoritarian democracies, elected, elected power, which are not democratic, elected kleptocracy, elected oligarchy. That's our challenge now. That's uh, the real danger. And for me, it's not, and that's the paradox, it's a chance for journalism. Because in that difficult, uh, difficult times, we find our professional ideal, our democratic ideal. An old world is dying and a new world is slow to be born. In the meantime, dark forces emerge everywhere. They want secret to hiding their prevarication, their privileges, their corruption. That's the time for the right to know. That's the time where journalism is at the first line for democracy. And to reply to your question, in France, Mediapart, which is independent in a situation or where the majority of the media are controlled by private interested, we do not want information in the service of the public interest. We make made many revelations about tax evasion, tax evasion, corruption, police violence, abuse of power, conflict of interest, sexual violence, and so on. What is the challenge and the difficulty, the real difficulty for all of us and some of our revelation uh, uh, make uh, Hello to the Indian colleagues, uh, concerns uh, corruption between France and India and other countries. We raise 
what we call in French, the lièvre, the heirs, by our revelations. We awake the society by our revelations, but it's up to society to catch the heirs, to catch <laughs> the revelations, to make a political reality with our revelation. It's our democratic challenge. We are very often in a very sad situation because we think that our revelation will create a democratic move and it's not arrive always, but we must do, we must do this work because it's finally our first mission to serve the right to know of the citizen, of the public without distinction of origin. Thank you. Thank you for those fighting words, Edwin. I'd like to follow up on that question, but meanwhile, let's have the results of the poll, just so we know who we are talking to and our audience feels. All right, so a third of our, of our uh, audience lives in a functioning democracy. That's very reassuring to know. And 41% is a challenged democracy and the rest, you know, in really, really difficult situation. So I guess, is this, does this add up to 100%? Maybe it does. Yeah, but, but it looks like many are still in, in, in democracies, but mostly in challenged democracies. In the second question, what do you think is the biggest challenge? The vast majority say it's disinformation, fake news, and hate speech and political parties that do not uphold democratic values. Um, and, and then state-sponsored violence is, and religious extremists are far less. I don't know if you, you guys are see, um, can they, I hope you are able to see the poll results, right? So in my country, journalism has generally upheld democratic values, which is good, but there are also some concerns about uh, the role of journalism in standing if, in its failure to stand up to autocracy, cheering populist autocrats, and deepening polarization. So, so this is this is really interesting. I'd like to take up from the results of this poll, and also from you know the points that you have all have raised, which is um, in polarized democracies or in democracies where. Um, freedoms are eroding or they're all of these anti-democratic and liberal forces. What, what can you, you know, how do you go against the grain when the public is willing to listen to illiberal views because of their frustrations with democracy? What do you do uh, in places where people have their own truths how can you bring back civil debate in the realm of facts? Um, I know most of you, all of you are facing this question in, in different ways. Let's start with you, Vinod, because India, as we know, is a hotbed, is a nest of disinformation. Um, how do you cast a light on facts? under this situation where people want to believe their own truths. Sorry, absolutely, Sheila. I think uh, this is probably the most um, vital question that the journalists uh, uh, that there is uh, an organized uh, approach that regionalized there are, there are for WhatsApp messages and Facebook posts to be created. They have been doing that uh, even when the internet penetration in the country was just about 10 percentage. Now, every, uh, most people in India have a smartphone, at least one person every home has one, even the poverty rate is quite high. So uh, you see if an autocrat wants and, and a political party which thrives on lies, um, whichever party that it is, or whichever leader that he, he or she is, there is, uh, there is a technological infrastructure in place that they can make use of. And up against this big power, this 
uh, you know, what the journalists or the institution of journalism or newsrooms are working against. Um, and the challenge in, in no sense, I mean, there are no immediate solutions for it. Um, uh, but as uh, Edwi was saying, I mean, there is this old fashioned mission of why we are in journalism at the first instance. We are here to document, to hold power accountable, to serve for the right of uh, the citizens to know. Uh, now, what impact it would have if we bury ourselves under that pressure all the time, especially in a country that I live in and where uh, the attacks on journalists have increased. Uh, a number of colleagues are in jail. Uh, you know, uh, one of my friends who I started working with, she was killed two years ago. Uh, 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 so, there, and even my in my own team uh, in caravan. There, are, uh, there was a woman journalist who was sexually molested last year while she was reporting. Uh, the three of my male colleagues uh, who were attacked, one even uh, uh, being tortured in, in, in a police station. Uh, uh, so now these are journalists who are getting uh, victimized by the state or the private interests or the mobs on the street. So the attack is, is, is real. Um, and we we get we are at the receiving end because we are chasing truth. We are in the business of truth telling, uh, so that needs to continue. Now, even just as we were starting this uh, conference, uh, the designer, uh, the the chief designer of the caravan called me because there is a death threat that came just just an hour ago. Because today is the first of the month, and we published the latest cover story, and uh, they are saying that the artist needs to be lynched. Um, uh, the, the journalist needs to be stabbed to death. So this is this has become, in some sense, either using social media or try to attack the spirit of journalists, or you use social, uh, you use colonial era rules to book journalists, or uh, you know you use uh, you know all kinds of tricks which is there, and you try to sort of get into private lives of individuals and then try to blackmail them. But I think just just being around and doing our job, our our own existence itself is I think the first line of defense. And that's the first line of saying no to the pressure. And I think history teaches us, gives us enough examples that finally it will, it will succeed. I mean, of course, uh, it might take a longer time in different countries, depending on the kind of powers that they, they will accumulate over the years, but hanging around there and doing a, our work uh, in, in spite of all the odds that would come on the way, I think it's the first job. Apple, what do you do if your audience refuses to believe you uh, or would would rather go with you know populist rhetoric or or the lies that are comforting in some way to them? Indeed, indeed, it's a big challenge that we all uh, dealing with at this point. But I think um, we have also great opportunities to now invest more in fact checking um, media and digital literacy. Uh, these are very important tools to help us. Uh, increasingly, I think journalism schools should also incorporate in their curriculum um, the ability and resources to uh, offer uh, kids coming in uh, with the kinds of tools that will help them uh, both to debunk some of these uh, claims um, and also to help uh, build. But I think on a larger scale, um, this is also an opportunity for journalism to lean out a little bit. Uh, we must always stress the point that journalism at the end of the day is a, is a democracy uh, project, which means that we have to build very creative alliances uh, with civil society, uh, with professional groups, uh, also see whether indeed in, in institutions like parliament and the judiciary, there will be actors that will be willing to uh, work with the media in, well, very strictly uh, in, in the sense of our protocols. But, I mean, Vinan made a very important point. We must double down on uh, fact-based reporting, verification, and I think the temptation is high these days to, to see media um, and journalism as a platform for commentary. I think we must make sure that the verification uh, quotient in journalism is given more currency, more impetus uh, 
So at the end of the day, what will really save us, apart from the kinds of alliances that we build to help give journalism and democracy some sense of consequence, it will be insisting on professional facts-based uh, uh, verification models of uh, journalism. Thank you. Maria Teresa, is there something more that we should do aside from what, you know, fact-checking, verification, um, telling, you know, supporting the democracy project, and we can talk more about that. What other things are, should journalists be able to do in, in this, in, a, in, in, a, in, in, an, in an information landscape that seems to be chaotic and flooded more by lies rather than factual information? I think we're also facing like a generational change that understand and absorb information in a different way. And of course we have a discredited democracies. Uh, it, is, it is a crisis of hope of that democracy is not, it's not functioning. It's not working for people. It does not deliver. So this, is, this space is being filled with populism and, and, and make believe quick solutions. So journalism has to work in a very polarized, as you say, and, and they themselves are not popular because of all this information and all this sort of discredit of, of democracy of which journalism is part of. So what do we do? I think that your question about how to go against the grain, I love that. I think the first thing, as my colleagues have said here in the panel, Vinod and Dapo, it's radical truth. You need to be even more radical in your truth. You have to really show what is not being shown because there's a lot of people there who connect with you when that happens. I've seen it over and over again. When, when people really believe you're saying things that nobody else really is, one, is, is really willing to say because it's risky, it's difficult, you make enemies, you, you gain a lot of friends. I do think of course about that collaboration is a way to join forces, make your team safer and your voice stronger. Uh, when you join forces and we lived it in Colombia, I've lived it all my life when we were making stories about paramilitaries, about you know really investigative reporting on the war. The only way we could tell those stories was, was joining forces with other media. But it also means that, that uh, you have to use the power of the collective, use the power of the citizens. Uh, I believe that you can learn from art, you can learn from theater, from humorists, from cartoonists. You are competing in a world where information is abundant and attention is scarce. So we really need to, to, to come up with new ways to reach these crowds because in, in a polarized society, People just don't believe you if you use the same old, same old sort of packaging. You need to go and, and team up with unlikely bedfellows and go and do really interesting stuff in a way that you reach people from a different corner, from a different angle. Uh, you capture their imagination in a different way, but also you include them and make them participate in your investigations. I think. Those of, uh, you know, many of my colleagues in Latin America are starting to do that with a lot of, with a lot of success. So it's, I think there is a lot of ways to sort of reach across that divide, uh, but also build up that credibility in a sort of, in a more radical and innovative way uh, than, than, than the traditional sort of hard news kind of way. Edwin, you talked about um, the old order dying, but the new one is not yet born. What do you do in that phase between the death of the old order and the birth of the new one? You're asking me? No, I was, I was, I was going to ask Edwin now because it was, it was the metaphor that, that he used <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I liked it. The birth, the death and birth. Yeah. Right, but we yeah. are in sort of this weird interregnum. It's not quite yeah. yet. The old yeah. order is not quite dead, and the new one is not yeah. quite born yet. She Sheila, what we do, we are fighting the monsters <laughs> because that's the time of sort of monster, what we call authoritarian democracy. Uh, there is some colleagues 
from uh, that are living with dictature, but the, 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 the political event of the last decade, it's authoritarian democracy, power with elected people. And when they are elected, they are fighting fundamental human rights. The question of opinion, it's the more, more important question. Our adversary in this time is opinion, the reign of opinion. That's a paradox. We are for the freedom of expression. But the freedom of expression is, uh, we are witnessing a deviation of freedom of expression in favor of rumors, fake news, propaganda, but also totalitarianism, racism, inequal ideologies. That's the question. Opinion, the reign of opinion against information. You know, Sheila, and all the as audience, it's an old fight, which is now increased by the digital revolution, the social network, an old fight. You know, in 1968, 67 exactly, a philosopher, Anna Arendt, in the New Yorker about truth and politics, she wrote that truth of facts, which are the more fragile truth and the more important in the democracy way, <laughs> they are in a fight against truth of opinion of truth of conviction, truth of belief, truth of propaganda. That's the challenge. And our, our role, the democratic responsibility of journalism, it's to <laughs> impulse truth of facts. You must think against your conviction, your belief, your, your prejudice. You, you must think uh, like uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in, a, in a sort of, of uh, freedom of uh, thinking. And that's, the, that's not a new question. That's an old question during <laughs> with the digital or the, uh, uh, the, the digital revolution. Uh, last word. I think, and our friend from Nigeria tell the same. The, the digital on the other side is a big opportunity for this fight because, and that is our experience with Mediapart during 14 years now, uh, just uh, uh, only digital, uh, uh, pure player uh, with no big media group, uh, just journalism, journalism, journalism. Journalism, no advertising, no, not other economic uh, model than the support of our public by the subscription. And it works, it works. It works economically and professionally. It works and it makes a sort of an uh, uh, example for all the profession. He, he make a sort of uh, uh, trust with our job. We can create a new situation by, by our information. And what I want, what I experiment, I, come, I came from the old press, the print and press, and I discover a more sustainable journalism, a more documented journalism, a more credible, verified, participative journalism, a journalism that creates a new relationship with the public. Uh, we create trust with the public. Uh, finally, to reply to a question, I think there, there is, it's only a fight. It's, a, it's a, the old fight of real journalism, journalism, that's not uh, 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 opinion journalism. That's a journalist that, that is churching, 
true for facts that the reason uh, and uh, that was the beginning of uh, our meeting investigative journalism is not a small part of journalism it's the earth of journalism we must find information that powers political powers economic power ideological power don't want to be known by the public, by the citizens. And if we make this fight, once, once a time, I don't know when, the democracy will be stronger, will be uh, more credible uh, and uh, uh, more real democracy. Thank you so much. I mean, our panelists have talked about what the role is of journalists at this very difficult moment and certainly truth-telling or radical truth, as Maria Teresa says, is front and center of that. But the other panelists have also talked about reinvigorating the public square with new facts, that journalism, by just being there, by, by speaking truth to power, already inspires people that democracy exists and is possible. It's the first line of defense. We also need to document for the future there may not be any changes now, but we can certainly document for, for the future. It is also a place in which we can empower citizens, as several of you have said. Um, Maria Teresa showed us that you can, we can win a few battles now, not all, but we can win some. And I think another important thing, which you have also talked about, Edwi, is giving voice to citizens, you know, amplifying the voices of opposition and resistance, which are being drowned out, is another role that we can play. So I'm now going to ask a provocative question from all of you and also from our audience. So I want a chat storm here. So at a time, and this is a question I know a lot of my friends who are out there in the front lines are facing. When you yourself are being attacked, when the watchdog press itself is the target of harassment, threats, and violence. Are we the new resistance? Is journalism the new resistance? Are we, is it time to recalibrate or rethink of our role as being strictly nonpartisan and non-participants in, in the civic space? Are we now the new resistance? Are we being forced by historical circumstances to be at the front lines of defending democracy and a free press. So I will ask Vinod this because he really is at the very front line. So I'll put you on the hot seat first, Vinod. And I invite our audience to come and answer the question yourselves and just put your answers in the chat box. Do you believe that journalists should be the resistance? So Vinod. I, I think the attack the answer to the attack on journalism is more journalism. Uh, if uh, reporting is getting attacked, do more hardcore stories, chase the, the biggest ambitious stories. And if people see it as resistance, of course it is resistance. Uh, uh, but I think it's, it's in pursuit for truth and pursuit for uh, uh, more hidden facts to be unearthed. And then if that's the case, if, uh, I mean, of course, the powerful interest would want to demonize you, would want to call you anti-national, which is what's happening in India. Uh, they would want to say that you're part of some big geopolitical interest to destabilize the country. Uh, uh, you are an extremist. You could be a religious fanatic, anything. I mean, whatever they want to name you, they would name you. And I think it is primarily to attack the spirit of uh, the institution, of the individuals. I think if we can uh, uh, overlook that and, uh, and hold our grounds, I think that's the best resistance. I don't think we should worry too much on what they would want to call you. So doing journalism and doing more journalism uh, and doing more investigative journalism wherever it's possible because uh, just just getting information that's the ordinary journalism, ordinary beat reporting, that time is over. Uh, if we see this in India, what we call the legacy newspapers, uh, either the governments have gone to them through the publishers and owners, or uh, there is an ideological uh, uh, allegiance of the editors of legacy newspapers so that they don't challenge the governments enough and they don't vet the corporations who are closer to the government enough. 
So it, it lies primarily on independent news organizations in each of these countries. And I think one should uh, consider this as also as an opportunity to do more journalism and go with it. I like what you said, that the answer to harassment and threats is more journalism. There is, um, Natalie Fletcher says here, journalism can become the catalyst for resistance, but we shouldn't say it is the resistance. Dapo, do you agree with that? Um, I think the, the special calling for journalism is that we help uh, readers, uh, audience to understand that the central basis of journalism is that it's a project of democracy. Journalism cannot exist in an abstraction. Uh, and to the extent that it's a project of democracy, we have to, when you say watchdog, it has effective and clear meaning. It is one, that we are setting the agenda, two, that we are really holding power accountable, and most importantly then, three, that then we provide iteration and space for what we then earlier called the public square. However, it is also true that in every historical epoch, you know, the institution will also find its own clear meaning. So I make the point that, you know, uh, during the anti-apartheid struggle, there is a clear call for what the media will play. Under a colonial era, the media is called to do. So the forces today, uh, today is for us to understand them. So how the media can help provide insights, uh, more analysis, less opinion, as Eddie has said, you know, um, effective, you know, investigation, um, but also to then put new actors on the line to make sure that, you know, tech companies that have become the greater purveyors of some of those greatest problems we are facing, the information, or com or if you like, communication crisis, which has uh, spawned uh, both disinformation and misinformation in many regards that we are putting them to account. So algorithms themselves now have to face the challenge of uh, accountability. But lastly, as we know better in Africa, and I'm sure also in Asia, no less of course in the United States, is that new forces that are also driving democracy towards more fascistic goals uh, and these are theocratic forces. It's, in, it's important that we help our audience, we help citizens understand, and this really calls on a lot of education on the part of the journalists themselves at a time like this. So yes, we are the resistance to the extent that, you know, uh, the period, the moment has called on us, but we cannot leave. The DNA of our profession already provides us tools to do all this. Thank you. Edwin, I'll have you respond to Jesset Enano here, who says, if truth is resistance, then journalism is the resistance. True or false? I don't know if we are the resistance, but I think we must resist <laughs> to all this uh, uh, anti-democratic forces. It's not an, a partisan, way of journalism. It's uh, only an involvement in what is our, in French, raison d'être, uh, 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 what is our uh, uh, mission. We are, as journalists, in the front line of democracy because the right to know, as the freedom of speech, for me, is before even in the chronology of the political ideas, is before democratic institution, before the right to vote and so on, to elect people, to have a government of the people and so on. You know, recently I discovered uh, and very old sentences before the first that was a French one, but France is not always uh, in, the, that doesn't respect always the, uh, the terms of this uh, first uh, uh, declaration of human rights. It was in, as you know, in 1789. Uh, and a few weeks before, the first mayor of Paris make a, 
proclamation that in French is la publicité et la sauvegarde du peuple. Publicité does not mean advertising at this time. That means reveal all facts of public interest. It's the safeguard of the people. The safeguard of the people. He announced that before uh, elected uh, democratic institution and so on. That's that's uh, the the reason we we. I, that's the reason I say just before that we 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 are in a very curious period. We are anxious, and there is many reasons for that. But at the same time, we we discovered the ideal. It's not a, a, a sort of comfortable journalism, elementary journalism, uh, sanitary journalism, notable journalism. We, I am 69, and now I am more young for my job than I was 10 or 15 years before, because I, I think it's time to fight, not to fight like, I repeat, a partisan guy, Find only for democracy. And also, and you, what do GIGN is the example of that? It's also a resistance without borders. In a time of rise of identity, of nationalism, of uh, xenophobia, of racism, we can, with this sort of cooperative journalism, create new solidarity, no fraternity. And it's a good news, no? Thank, thank you. Maria Teresa, I'll, I'll have you ask, answer this question as well, but our, our, our audience here has put various things. One, um, there is a Russian journalist, I believe, I cannot read Russian, but they say our job is to tell the truth, but telling the truth turned out to be the resistance. There is Tiago Reis, um, from, from Brazil, I believe, and he's saying uh, in, in Rome, Brazilian journalists were attacked by security guards of President Bolsonaro yesterday. Supporters of the president su supported the attack, considering the press to be the enemy. On the other hand, opponents of the president believe that the mainstream press is reaping what it sowed. There is at these times a feeling of isolation. What do you do? How do you deal in, with this situation when it seems that everyone is against professional journalism? So I think Sheila and a lot of the people in the chat have said that journalism is also needing to, to be renewed itself. And I think there is a lot of crisis in journalism and that part of the regime that it's dying, it's also journalism. And a lot of the media were not so much Speak, speaking truth to power, but a lot of them were sitting in power and very cozy with power. And I think that has taken a toll in many, many, many ways. I'm not talking about Brazilian press particularly. I think Brazilian press actually is particularly good in that way. But I think there is another aspect to what Eddie and, and, and the colleagues were saying, which is, I think, I mean, we are bound to be absorbed by our circumstances. You know, Ortega I guess, said, the thinker said, man is, is a product of its circumstance. And I think journalists who are in the middle of what's happening cannot say, oh no, I don't have anything to do with circumstances. I'm above everything. We are not, we are part of the circumstances and we're bound to be absorbed into these fights, street fights for the truth. And I think that we need to, 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 to have a, like a very strong internal discipline of reporting against our own prejudice and our own biases and, 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 and not give them the, the, the satisfaction, give them, I mean, those in power, those who want to be authoritarian populist uh, of, of, of getting into a fight in the sense of becoming activists and becoming, you know, and then get letting opinion, uh, using Eddie's words, letting opinion win our, our truth and our fact uh, finding mission. So that is not easy. I have seen it country after country. I saw it in Venezuela 
when it was falling down, the whole democratic regime, journalists, and a lot of them were sort of put into this mode of, okay, instead of going and doing more journalism, like, like, uh, uh, like Vinod was saying, it was, they, they became a, 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 an enemy of the government, a, 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 an opposition party. And that is a, that is a temptation which, which we must resist. I, I think that very firmly. And I think that what really prevails, and if that is resistance, that's the kind of resistance I believe, is sticking to your job of reporting against even your own prejudices and your own political passions. I would like to carry again this con to pursue this conversation about when journalists are under attack, what they what are they supposed to do? Because it is coming up in in the questions, and here is one which I think is is uh, from Rodrigo Menegal Shuinsky, and and Rodrigo says, "I don't want to be a hero or resistance fighter. I want to do my job, which happens as many other jobs to be crucial for society." Isn't this way of thinking the journalist as a hero dangerous? Aren't we normalizing the awful working conditions as part of this job? So um, it's, it's, it's a good question, but I'd like to follow up with that and I'd like you to address it. It's given that we ourselves are under attack, do we need to rethink how we talk about press freedom? and what alliances we need in order to support a free press. Who are our allies, um, both locally, internationally, internationally, the fact that some countries, Russia, China among them, are putting forth a different version, you know, sort of illiberal vision of, of governance, of government, and they're gaining traction because of the shortcomings of our democracy. Do we need to rethink how we talk about a free press and the role of a free press and about our role as watchdog journalists? Um, Dapo, perhaps you can talk about how you're thinking of this in the context of Nigeria and Africa. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, and not only journalism, every institution will have uh, to deal with historical processes. Um, and I think in, re in regards to the key problems that journalism faces today, uh, repressive laws, business models that are collapsing, um, this, the whole information crisis uh, spawned by technology companies that has really made our job difficult. We will face, you know, in ourselves a very uh, existential kind of a crisis. Uh, the challenge at every moment like this, I think, is how do you then innovate on this one? Because it's a problem, right? But then there's also an opportunity at the oversight of it. Um, never forgetting that, you know, our job is to ensure that we want to make democracy meaningful, that we really have to work on the side of the people. That means, you know, the public good purpose of journalism should always be. So I think with regards to the kinds of tools that we use, uh, of course, uh, Maria made something very interesting point earlier, how you could then use new forms, uh, however, you have then to put the DNA of journalism, which is still verification and truth telling, but you can realize them, you know, either through more um, fun seeking uh, methodologies. So methodologies will change, will shift. Um, so we, but at the heart is that we know that we are doing innovation, innovation in how we tell the stories. We're bringing more data journalism to purpose. Um, we also distributing them in new and more uh, innovative ways and also helping to finance our journalism, not around models that have become obviously atrophied now, advertising is not going there, sales are not going there. Uh, so we really have to find, uh, you know, from things like collaborative work that people can do 
uh, to save themselves, you know, in very difficult situation. So I think what all this boils down to is how are we collaborating? How are we innovating on the whole processes of how we do stories, how we distribute stories, and how we finance our journalism in a time like this? Okay, let me ask a difficult question. You know, the power of journalism is the power of amplification. Right. We we have a big uh, we have a big voice. The question is, we we decide what voices we amplify, and by deciding, are we not necessarily taking sides? So does this mean that we need to rethink what press freedom really means? Is it freedom for everybody? Um, difficult question. Let me ask uh, Edwi because it looks like you've been here longer than any of us on this panel. <laughs> When we talk about press freedom, is it press freedom for everybody? Or is it press freedom for whom or for what? Don't we all make decisions about what we report about and what we choose to be, to judge as important and relevant for the public to know? Hmm. Thank you, Cheda. Uh, you know, we, uh, a real democracy is a pluralist democracy. That's the reason there is uh, different agendas, different media. <laughs> The question is, the, is the democratic ecosystem is strong or is fragile? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, my work for my tradition is that I work for everybody, even against my opinion, my friends, <laughs> my cooperation, because I must reveal what is in the public interest, even if it's, con it's disturbing for my conviction, my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my belief, and so on. Uh, that's the, the point. We, we, all of us, we have conviction. We have a belief. Uh, uh, we have a sort of cultural uh, uh, heritage, and so on. The question is, and that's the reason our responsibility, if there is only opinion, my opinion against your opinion, finally, my identity against your identity, my party against your party, my community against your community, my religion against your religion, and so on, it will be the war of all against all. That's the, the responsibility of journalism to say, you must put the truth of facts, verified, documented, <laughs> in the center of the public debate, not only opinion against opinion. And that's the, the question about the question of heroism. I don't want, and we don't want to be hero. I do agree, we want to do normally our job. But the problem is that for authoritarian power, journalism, because of this responsibility, is seen more dangerous than political opponents. Because truth of facts is more dangerous for this sort of power, with this secret, this corruption, prevarication, than uh, contrary opinions. It's not a debate of opinion. They, they are afraid against the truth. And, you know, even people said when we reveal, reveal uh, big revelation about corruption, they say, you are courageous. Uh, it was a uh, <laughs> good job and so on. I say, OK, but we are a small fish in a very polluted sea. <laughs> And I say to the people, don't say we are courageous. Don't say bravo. Work to make the sea <laughs> clean. The sea must be cleaned up. That's your job. Clean the sea. <laughs> That's, you don't must be at the, like a spectacle. And you, the, the, the very courageous small journalist against a very big power. Uh, to synthesize, uh, we, we are not hero, but the authoritarian uh, 
direction of our democracy at this time make us uh, in a situation of uh, resistance, of, uh, of uh, a sort of, uh, uh, yes, a, a sort of uh, engagement, involvement in this uh, democratic fight. And that's a, a new situation. It's not comfortable, but it's also uh, a, a new, uh, a new, uh, a new ideal of our profession. We could go on for a long time discussing this. This is really, you know, the heart of the dilemma that a lot of journalists are facing right now. But I also want us to address some of the some of the questions that have been put forth by our audience. So maybe Vinod, you can take this. How do you report on government sponsored violence if it is started in the name of religion? Vinod, you can also talk about the other themes have been you can add on to the debate about uh, resistance and truth telling and so on, if, if you would like, yeah. Sure, or redefining um, what a free press is, yeah. I think it's uh, when you have a religion based narrative going, and uh, right now in India, the political rise of uh, the, the rise of the political Hinduism is creating a lot of stress on institutions. Now, uh, historically speaking, uh, this was in the first general election post-independence in India, was a group of people who had about three to five percentage votes. Now, in a democratic process, they have gained about 37 percentage votes and they have come to power uh, using the same constitution that they burned uh, soon after independence, uh, burning uh, all kinds of institutional ideas of what the country is. Now, this poses a very genuine problem for uh, everyone, including journalists, where uh, there are people and forces who do not believe in constitution and constitutional values, the idea of India in many sense. And uh, this is where uh, uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who is the rock star of that movement, so to speak, uh, is not alone. And as journalists, one will be making a mistake of just concentrating on him compared to many other autocrats because Prime Minister Modi is the byproduct of a 90 year old movement. Uh, so whether he's there tomorrow or not, the movement uh, which whose mentors had established relationship with Mussolini or uh, have written very, uh, uh, very glowingly about Hitler uh, have spread a network of um, followers who are, are believing in, in a feudal kind of a system and they are modeling themselves after that. So the mobs can get formed anytime. They have people, uh, this is also a movement which has over 60 organizations of, you know, even people in law and judiciary are members of it, the organizations for uh, uh, students, for women. So it's, it's, it's a real network on the ground and attacks based on um, uh, 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 the religious lines, and when journalists go to cover that, and that's exactly what happened for caravan journalists last year, when President Trump was in Delhi, just 10 miles away from there, uh, nearly some 40, 50 Muslims were getting killed. And journalists who went to report that, of course, just after, in, in spite of the pandemic, when you continue to follow up on the religious violence, the journalists get attacked. Um, and then the journal, it will become very difficult for journalists to go and cover it. So in, in many sense, I think religion-based uh, polarization and making and remaking of a new nation, in, so to speak, will put everyone's religious identity in question, even when you are in, in, uh, in the pursuit of, of truth. And, 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 and uh, often as editors, there are occupational and security risks that we need to take into account, what journalists we put on the ground and so forth. I, I think. Uh, there is no easy answer to any of it. Uh, I think what we, we need to take it one day at a time because the powers in many sense can be much bigger than you can think of. Uh, and they also uh, use all kinds of spying devices uh, and in, in offices and in, in journalists, private phones and so forth. So I think um, uh, the answer is, is um, uh, you know, in some sense, you go by what the story is which needs to be done on that day what story needs to be done on that season. Uh, in some sense, the calendar is not designed by you or decided by you. It is there for you to follow. Uh, but then you pursue truth on any given assignment and, and, and follow up. I mean, no, mat no matter what the danger is waiting for you on the road. Thank you, Vinod. Um, there's a 
question here that I'll pose to Maria Teresa from Ernesto Cabral. To what extent should watchdog journalism be no longer, no longer be a local or national effort, but a transnational one? And Maria Teresa, maybe you can also take this question about Brazil and Turkey, similar questions from Laura Schofield. One of the tools used by groups who threaten democracy is actually journalism. We have plenty of sites dressed as professional journalism, but in reality are full of disinformation, anti-democratic. How should we deal with it? How should we defend the importance of journalism in maintaining democracy when there are sites like these? Yes, and I think in Brazil, those sites were really, for example, during the election of Bolsonaro, we could see, uh, you know, the power of sites that you would go and start to look into them. And it were, you know, sites put up with $200 of supposedly donations from the public, and they had correspondents all over the world. So you would say, what, what is that, you know? So my answer to Lara and to Ayla, I, I think from, from Turkey is, I think the only solution here is more journalism. I think the only way to expose these kinds of sites is to be aware that they exist and to really dig up and do investigative journalism. And sometimes, especially with this information, investigative journalism about this information has to be collaborative. Because as we know, these bots, these, 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 these entities that are polluting the sea <laughs> that, uh, that our colleague was talking about, they are working together or they're, they're being purchased or bought or, 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 or manipulated in a very cohesive, cohesive way. And they come into a country and they create all these things when, whenever there is com an election coming, they create all this information. So we need to, to have like a permanent arm and about how to investigate this information. I think every media outlet that is doing investigative journalism should be investigating, not just fact checking, not just seeing this is not true, investigating and exposing who is behind this disinformation. I think that's absolutely key. And the other question was? Was um, collaboration, not just nationally, ah, okay. but across I, borders. I do believe yeah. that more and more we need to collaborate, whether locally, with, it doesn't mean transnational versus local because there is no transnational if there's no local. It, we couldn't in CLIP do even cross-border investigative reporting and ICIJ couldn't do that either and everybody else and OCCRP if they didn't have local partners, people in the ground, people in the nations doing really amazing job because it, it would be impossible without the know-how of local journalists. But I do believe that collaboration has to be growingly, growingly part of the agenda of every media. Work with citizens, work, work with other people, work with friendly businesses, work with whomever you can work that is helping you get to the bottom of things and, and cross border and, and, and sometimes cross national. You know, we saw in the, in the Pandora Papers something amazing in Argentina, in Mexico in Peru, media of the same country collaborating on the same story, working this together. And of course they did a much better job than the, if each, each one of them were competing with each other. So I do think collaboration inside the country is also very, very important, especially in big countries. So there's a question here from Ben Bilua. How can the media approach a situation where democracy is seen as an imported ideology or a foreign concept? The democracy is a Western notion and not applicable to the rest of the world. How do you, I mean, so many countries are now resurrecting and reinvigorating this argument, right? That democracy is a Western liberal import, not applicable to people like us. Dapo, you'd like to take that? Interestingly, I was just typing something in response to <laughs> it in the, in the chat box. <laughs> so, but as, I, I think the point is to sh show where these kinds of uh, thoughts and ideas are coming from. Often they are from illiberal sources and forces that are arranged against uh, democracy itself. But at the end of the day, I think we owe it a, a duty to point out that 
as part of the institutions and uh, values and norms of uh, democracy is that of uh, an accountability uh, media. And for that reason, that is the place that journalism resides in. And also just to show that, you know, uh, uh, the global movement is uh, towards more universal norms, uh, as it were. <laughs> uh, things like human rights have also been uh, poo pooed in this regard to say that there are Asian values, African values. Uh, um, but uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, there are universal human values. And um, uh, with regards to you know keeping the processes of accountability uh, on the rail. This is where journalism resides. So um, it, it it will serve the same purpose in Africa, in Asia, in the United States, and so on. You know, um, as long as there's a power structure, and that power structure needs to provide uh, uh, accountability to people. So we the the organizers are giving us a little bit more time so we can end at like 10:45 but but I just like to point out that many of you when you uh, talk about the challenges facing journalists are are looking are very inward looking and and when we talk about broad issues of press freedom and the toxicity of the information landscape certainly a lot of things are beyond our own control so what, I'll just go around and, and ask you, what do you think are the key interventions that need to be made in order to make for a, an information environment that is more partial, that amplifies truth rather than lies, right? And let's, let's go around and just one thing and explain that one thing because, because we've also been, we we're putting the responsibility, it seems to me, on ourselves. As you said, Edwi, we are small fish in a polluted sea, and the responsibility of, of cleaning that sea is not just ours, but who else needs to help in that cleanup? Can we have very specific answers about who should be held responsible first for the pollution and who should take key roles or should be responsible for cleaning up as well? So, um, Edwi, since you started this metaphor about the fish in the polluted sea, yeah. Our discussion is a sort of uh, dialogue between pessimism and optimism. But you know, it's an old sentence. Uh, pessimism of intelligence, optimism of uh, volunt volonté, the, the, uh, the will, exact, exact. And it's all sentence. And I think it's, we must be uh, uh, we got see frankly the situation uh, and that's the pessimism but what i want to i will reply to to your to your question i think we must make the bet of society uh, we must create a new alliance with society it's it's a the, the reply to the question about uh, is democracy is a sort of occidental uh, exploitation. Uh, I aware this time is now the time with authoritarian uh, 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 take, uh, uh, issue in, in all democracy. But 10 years before in North Africa, in all the Arabic world, in the Middle East, and in other many countries, society create new ideal, which, like Dapo said, uh, human values of justice, of equality, of uh, uh, transparency, and so on, which are, there is no nationality for that. There is no uh, uh, own uh, nation that own by uh, uh, tradition uh, this value. And what's arrived? A sort of coalition between our government in Occidental countries, where the old autocrats against this uh, uprising of the society. In our country, France, it's the big uh, scandal about the Libyan case uh, involving uh, 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 president of our republic and with corruption. Uh, it's, a, it's a big scandal. Uh, and I think 
that's 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 uh, the way it's the alliance with the society that's the reason uh, i am the advocate of uh, of the digital because the digital can create this sort of participative journalism. As you say, Sheila, uh, uh, be uh, also the voice of the society, uh, uh, give uh, uh, the platform to express the society, because our uh, enemy is not the social network. You know, in my country at this time, the more racist, the more uh, disgusting in a democracy, uh, 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 in the democratic way, uh, media is not the social network. It's private network, TV network, radio network, owned by oligarchs, very established oligarchs. It's not the people. It's not the bad people from the, the, uh, uh, the basement of the society. It's the upper side of the oligarch of the bourgeois society and the same oligarch that made uh, a business uh, uh, in Africa with alliance with the uh, dictators or uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the African continent. That, that's the, that's the, the, my replay. And I want to say also uh, the, the question of the leaks and the cooperative journalism is very important because there, there, it's the time of climate change. It's a time of a big challenge for humanity, for nature, for all the life, <laughs> not, not uh, 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 our planet, but uh, our, uh, our human life, our solidarity. It's a very urgent situation. How can we create a new conscience about that by our revelation? When you reveal the, 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 the big tax evasion, all this riches stilled from the nation, not used for the public interest, not used for the uh, ecological challenges, you create a new comprehension, uh, a, new, uh, uh, a new comprehension for all the people about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the very, very, very necessity to act <laughs> rapidly, strongly about the climate change. And that's, that's, uh, that's my way, create a new alliance with the society uh, uh, and, and that that will be the way to 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 find solution because we are not our work is to put problems <laughs> to uh, to make uh, uh, difficulties because uh, when we reveal bad news it's a problem for the society dapo and maria teresa let let's end here with with a question for the both of you what Name us one thing that needs to change if watchdog journalism is to survive and thrive in this era. Forgive, yeah, me, boy, to, forgive yeah. me to do quickly more than one, but also in yeah. one. One, I think that you know we need to build new business models that will sustain the media. Uh, without a new business model, media is totally unable to move ahead. Uh, I think we need a way to also engage with the, uh, this is probably true in Africa, uh, the whole judicial sector, which is totally now beholden to an executive branch. Uh, they themselves now see <laughs> journalism as part of the enemies, whereas, you know, we ought to be both part of the two key institutions that can hold uh, democracy uh, in account. So. Uh, these two things are really in dire need, definitely in Africa. Thank you. And Maria Teresa, let's end with you. Yeah. Okay, I think that I think that big platforms need to be part of the big, I don't know, vacuum machines that clean that sea. I mean, they have a big responsibility. They have to invest much more. And I think for journalism to survive. Uh, because these are our distribution platforms and we cannot control them. I think they have to do a much better role in helping 
uh, to create a, a model for, for business for journalism. Not that they give us money because they, that would be, make us independent, I mean, dependent on them, but helping really come together with solutions on, on how to create a, a way to support journalism. And I think the other thing that should be really important is uh, uh, for journalism is to be to, to push for transparency everywhere. All these leaks, everything, you know, that is going to help journalists everywhere to, 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 to be able to access the information that is hidden, where all this power is standing on. So I think that a big push, a, a big coalition in the world for transparency uh, would make our, our, our life and our effecti effect effectiveness much greater. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been a very good panel. We, we, over, we went over our time, but our audience seems to be really engaged in this. So thank you so much. I agree with all of you that we are in this space between, between pessimism and hope, between you know, recognizing the structural impediments to what we do, but also seeing that with our agency, what we can do, that there's promise and there's hope for investigative journalism, even in these difficult times. I'd like to call um, our great helmsman, David Kaplan, to, to formally close this <laughs> panel. But thank you so, so much, everyone, for all the brilliant uh, and eloquent uh, answers and all the metaphors that I've jotted down in my, in my, in my notebook about the current situation. So Mr. Kaplan. Uh, Sheila, that, that was brilliant. I, I think if we weren't online, <clears throat> you, you would hear 400 people clapping furiously. Uh, it, it was enlightening. It was inspiring. Uh, it, it was it was tough and sober. Uh, I, I, I was trying to tweet out a few things. There were so many quotes from from all five of you. It, it was difficult to choose. I, I, I think. Um, all of you are a tribute to how one person really can make a difference. You, you have all done extraordinary things in your countries, in your regions, and, and in the world. And journalism and uh, our world is better for it. Thank you all so much. Um, uh, Edwi, Maria Teresa, Vinod, Dapo, uh, and, and Sheila, uh, what, what, what an awesome quintet you are. So a uh, huge thanks from, from GIJN, from the Global Conference. You've got us off to a uh, terrific start. They still got almost 400 people who have been listening through, uh, through all this. Um, I just want to say very briefly, uh, we, <clears throat> sorry, th this is the uh, end of our um, live programming today. We're just doing this one session today but we have nearly 80 sessions starting early tomorrow. Uh, join us, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Eastern time uh, in the US uh, at 8.15 tomorrow. That will be midday in Europe, Africa and the Middle East and uh, late afternoon, early evening in uh, Asia Pacific. We're on a global schedule, so please follow us on Tuesday uh, it's the America's Day. Wednesday is Africa, Europe, and Middle East Day. Uh, Asia Pacific is on Thursday. And then Friday, we go back to our kind of prime time global schedule. Um, so there's, there's 18 sessions tomorrow, lots of great stuff. Again, huge thanks to this extraordinary group of journalists. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, everybody. We'll, we'll see you soon, tomorrow, I hope. Bye-bye.